Welcome back. You are listening to Nate the Hate on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. And with that, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Modern Vintage Gamer. Hello, Nate. It's great to be here. How are you doing today? I am doing quite well. As earlier this week, it was my birthday oh. where I had officially transferred into old age. Happy birthday. Thank you. You are, I share you, a birthday very, with the Xbox. You're very low key. You you never like announce these things. No, I don't. So, and yeah, I don't do birthday streams or anything like that. How did you how did you celebrate your day? Did you have a good day? It was a good day. Just, you know, low key thing. Mm -hmm. Saw a family, had some cake, got some socks and stuff for birthday gifts, you know, the essentials, the yep. things you need. Especially with and, the, the the colder weather fast approaching need those socks. that's right need, need new socks and gotta say warm as the winter months approach but yes thank you for the birthday wishes and for those who made the comment in the youtube channel's comment section on our prior video earlier this week who wished a happy birthday thank you to you as well and anyone who may be leaving the comment on this video thank you in i guess the future but with that, I'm going to go to today's topic, and it's going to be about Sony's recent release, which is the PlayStation Portal, their streaming product that lets you play PlayStation 5 or any game that you have installed on your PlayStation 5 anywhere, anytime. And this is definitely a curious bit of hardware from Sony, and it's one that you and I had approached with a lot of caution and at times outright dismissal. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can say that again. I mean, let's uh, let's let's kind of go back in time, maybe a year ago, um, when I think this was first rumored, I believe, by Tom Henderson. The timing may be a little off, so I, forgive me, but I, I feel like it was about a year ago when uh, there was some chatter about some type of portable PlayStation device, streaming device, and I disregarded it. I I actually said it was inaccurate I don't, like i kind of just felt like maybe this did exist but it was never something that was going to get out of sony's r d lab or playstation's r d lab but um i have since uh apologized to tom and said i was wrong and he was correct but yeah the playstation portal is something that i've kind of struggled with thinking about over the last, like I said, since it was announced and since it was actually officially announced as something that I didn't really know what kind of use case and who, who it was meant for. But as you said, uh, we've had a chance to both uh, take a look at it and uh, we're going to give our thoughts on it. Yes. And given that it is a streaming device, how I want to start today's conversation about it was by sharing our own internet setup and our in-home network so that when we discuss the results we got, people do have a reference level to kind of point to and they can say, okay, my setup was similar or my setup was very dissimilar. So maybe that's why my performance is different than what they are relaying here because this is going to be a device where everyone's testimony is going to differ based on your in-home network, which yeah. really will come down to the quality of the signal that your router is putting out there. It's not strictly about your internet connection. You could have exceptionally fast internet, but if your router setup isn't of optimum level, you're not going to have a good experience here. So I thought it was important for us to really relay how our network is set up in our home and whether our PS5 is hardwired or if it is using Wi-Fi and things like that so that people do have that reference point. And we can start with your in-home setup with your PlayStation 5 and your general in-home network. Yeah, so I'm running um, Wi-Fi 6 in the house, um, but I also have Wi-Fi, I think it's Wi-Fi 5 and then kind of the well, the 5 gigahertz and also have the 2.4. Um, I generally don't use the 2.4 for anything other than legacy these days, but the actual PS5 itself, Nate, is is hardwired via ethernet cable um, into my directly into my router. So I've got a physical connection 
with the PS5, then of course I'm using my five gigahertz Wi-Fi to connect uh, the portal to the PlayStation. What about you? What do you what do you got going on over there? So my PlayStation 5 is set up via Wi-Fi and it is now set up on the 5 gigahertz band. Prior to just now or this week, it was on the 2.4 gigahertz band Mm -hmm. because you have to manually go into your router settings and disable the 2.4 because the PlayStation 5 will default to 2.4 depending on how your router is set up. Some routers will list the two bands as independent. So when you were setting up your PlayStation 5, you could have chosen the faster one, but some will only come up with a single you know, listing when it's finding your router and it just defaults 2.4. So I had disabled that this week to ensure that the portal would be on a 5 gigahertz connection. The Wi-Fi system itself from the router is Wi-Fi 6 and mm-hmm. it is a gigabit connection from Verizon. And I do have two routers in my home one is just for legacy sake and it was just easier to leave everything on that same password and set up instead of changing all the settings on other be it the computer or other systems i just kept them on that so right now the playstation 5 and the portal are actually the only two systems coming from this verizon router so it is kind of an optimum setting for them so there's going to be very little interference and such because there's no real shared devices outside of just those two right so when we got the playstation portal we obviously had to unbox it and do the initial booting process and i want to talk about some of those impressions what did you think about the initial startup process to get the playstation (laughs) portal all set up and ready to go it was it was a little strange for me nate i got i'm not gonna lie um i wasn't when i first unboxed it I wasn't really sure. First of all, I wasn't sure how to turn the thing on. Let's let's start with let's start with that. Like was <laughs> I was pressing different buttons. I was pressing like the PlayStation button and nothing was happening. In fact, um I had to ask you how to turn it on, right? Uh of course I could have just, mm-hmm. you know, taken the manual out and and kind of gone through that. But I was getting a little frustrated because I I got to be honest, I felt like, you know, usually there's like a a a sliding switch on the side or something like that where you know you basically turn it on and then you tell me we'll just hold down the button on the top top left for a couple of seconds and i was like oh okay um so i did that and then obviously it came to life this setup process for me um i i went the qr code uh route so basically went the qr code pulled up the app on my phone logged into the app you know gave the two-factor authentication code and I was in. But I was a little confused as to how this actually would pair itself to a PS5. Um, So my initial thought was to kind of just treat it like a, just a regular DualSense controller. And kind of the way that you pair that, as you know, is you just take a a USB-C cable and just plug it into the PS5 you want to pair it with for the first time and then you've paired it, right? So that was my initial kind of thought process here, but that wasn't it at all. It was basically, you know, you you uh, get it on get it onto your local Wi-Fi, and then log into your PlayStation account. Um, and I think the reason why they've done that, and and something that I found out later, and I think I'm not sure if you know this, Nate. You may already know this, but I I only learned this pretty recently was that you can actually have the portal connect to different PlayStation 5. So if you have three of them in your household, I'm not sure why you would have three of them in your household unless you had a big <laughs> a big family and you had a lot of kids maybe. Um, you can actually pair it to any of the three that you've registered the portal with. So I only heard about that kind of after the fact. So that makes sense in terms of the way that they expect you to set it up. But overall, setup was... A little, a little confusing and a little weird to me. I wasn't really quite sure which way I should proceed. What about you? How did you? How did you fare? Hopefully, you fared better than I did. I fared a little bit better than you did, but there were a few points of confusion in the process. So, you know, I powered it on, went through the initial steps, had logged into my account. I didn't use the QR code, mm-hmm. and it had me do a mini game of sorts where I had to match up 10 images 
of a room and its layout to another picture that just showed shadows of objects. Right. In a room. Right. And I had done it and at first I didn't really understand what it was asking me. And that's because I just wanted to get the initial process done with as quick as possible. Yeah. So I didn't read. And I thought it wanted me to kind of manipulate the image to just match how the image was laid out. So like if it was a slight angle, I was just looking at that. I wasn't looking at the furniture and the shadows and such. So I failed the first time. Yes. Then I understood what was happening. And I made one mistake out of the 10 options. Mm -hmm. And I had to do it again. And I'm kind of now at this point saying, okay, what did I make a mistake? And it was, I confused a chair for a baby stroller. (laughs) And I mean, it's because the shadow wasn't really that detailed. So it was easy to confuse. It was facing the proper direction. Everything else matched. But I I eventually did succeed and match all 10 pictures. Mm -hmm. Then it downloaded a i believe it was in the area of 160 megabyte update yeah okay. yeah and i, I want to talk to you about my experience there too but please go ahead like i'm expecting an update no big deal downloads the file and it begins the installation process mm-hmm. now i'm expecting it to move quite quick because when you have a switch you have the xbox you have the playstation 5 these platforms update exceedingly fast quick right and here we are with the portal and it in the installation process i'm looking at it and it's sitting at 15 percent, and it got there fairly fast then it went up to about i believe it was 44 percent, mm-hmm. and then it it felt as though it was stuck at 44 percent in the area of maybe five minutes to the point where i'm beginning to say to myself did this just brick during the update <laughs> dude I'm like, this is this is exactly my experience as well i i finally got it up and running and i finally got log- logged into my playstation network and it said yep just need to do a little update and yeah it was a pretty small update which took a very very long time to apply to the portal and yeah, I was stuck mm-hmm. on that like 40 something percent as well. And I thought my system had bricked itself. Like I thought something was wrong, you know, like maybe it had lost its connection or, or something had happened, right? And I remember I just kind of left it there, just waiting and waiting and waiting. And then I put it down um, to grab a drink or something. And it was still, I came back and it was still there. And I was like, okay, this thing is bricked. This is, this is like, crashed or something so i'm i'm just going to restart it i'm going to reset it right and then as soon as i picked it up it it started moving again i was like all right i think this is just taking a lot a lot longer than i anticipated and so i'm glad you you said the same thing because i wasn't really sure what was going on i felt like maybe there was some network congestion or or you know something was going on with the the update server that was being hammered or something but in the end, uh, it, you know, it took a long time to update a pretty small patch, but it finally got there. Yeah, I want to say the entire process maybe took around 10 to 15 minutes, which was just very surprising to me, especially just in the modern day of technology where everything is so quick. Yeah, It almost felt like going back to the Wii U where you yeah. had to download the entire operating system at launch and it took a long time. It obviously didn't take that long here that is hyperbole Mm -hmm. but it did feel as though this was taking a significant amount of time and when you get a new product you know you're excited you want to test it out especially something like the portal you want to see if it can deliver on the promise of streaming playstation 5 games in a reliable way yeah you really want to you know get right to it and to be greeted with this five to ten minute installation period it was kind of deflating in a way you know you're a kid at christmas you just opened your gift yeah i can't wait to play not just yet (laughs) you have to go through numerous steps and processes right but once we did get beyond that it was time to see what is this platform or device all about and i want to go into just some of our general impressions of the portal itself the weight the feel the layout and everything and we can start with you what were your first impressions when you had the device in hand well when i actually picked it up i mean look i think the portal kind of got criticized for looking literally like a dual sense that was just completely, you know, sliced directly in the middle. 
and some type of eight inch display was just like glued in between the two pieces. I mean, to be honest, Nate, it's not far from that as far as the way it looks. It does look like they just slapped on a, a an eight inch screen in between two halves of a dual sense controller. But I think the overall feel is actually really, really good. Um, I'm a big fan of the dual sense controller anyway. So I've, I've really uh, come to enjoy the feel of the dual sense i like it i've i've been a fan of it ever since the first day that the the ps5 released so for me i i feel like the overall feel is exceptional uh believe it or not i was actually a little surprised as to how better it was than i thought it would be because i just kind of felt like um it could have been because it's very, you know, it's very elongated, right? Like it's, you know, you got that big screen in between these two, two kind of uh, controllers on either side. And I, and I kind of felt like maybe it wouldn't feel as natural as I thought it would, but it, it almost reminded me of the Steam Deck, you know, like if you look at the Steam Deck, you think, how the, how the heck is that comfortable? You know, because like, the buttons are so high up on the form factor. And you kind of look at it and you think, no one no one's going to enjoy the feel of this but when you actually you know have it in motion or in your hand and you're in your and you're you know testing it out it feels very natural to me um so i overall i really like the 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 um you know the the feel of the product i think i think sony did a really good job with this it's actually better than uh, i had thought it would be yeah the feel of the portal in hand is quite remarkable it feels quite natural it's very ergonomic yep and i'd say it's arguably one of the most comfortable portable devices that i have used in many a year i'd say this is far more ergonomic than even the switch itself yeah and given the size of the unit as you said it's very elongated it has that eight inch screen in the middle that is i mean it looks massive when you really see it for the first time but just the feel of having those two two halves of a dual sense in your hand it feels very comfortable it feels familiar you know exactly where the buttons are you know exactly how you're going to play there is a slight adjustment period as the analog sticks are just a bit smaller on the portal than a standard dual sense i think the analog sticks are actually the same size as what you would find on a playstation vita 2 or not playstation vita the playstation vr mm -hmm. to controller right i think the analog sticks are around the same size there and you do have to adjust slightly because even though the size difference is very minimal it is something that you will notice when the analog stick is pressed against your thumb and you are controlling a character but it's definitely still within the range of feeling functional and comfortable when you are playing a game on the device and even the weight of the system it was kind of a concern going into it. Is this going to be heavy? Because you have, again, that screen, you have a battery. Yeah. And I don't think, I think the, I would say the hardware is very well, you know, I'd say the weight is evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can hold it with one hand, be it on the left or right side, and not feel as though I'm going to, you know, fall over with it. It's nice. It's well balanced. And I think, anyone can really pick up and play except maybe if you're an exceptionally young child you might not be able to grasp the portal all that firmly and be able to play comfortably but for any adult i don't think the weight of the system is going to be an issue i agree i think you know anyone that that is you know over you know the age of like 15 16 is going to feel more than comfortable holding this it's um it's very very good i and as a, another test i'd kind of let my wife take a hold of it and grab it and see what she felt or thought of it and she loved it i mean she thought it, it felt very natural and um you know she was navigating and, and playing some games on it as well so look i think sony did a lot of focus testing on this you know they didn't just kind of rush it out to market um and make it you know look and feel ridiculous i mean it still looks a little ridiculous let's be honest i feel like the aesthetics could have been better but overall the feel of the product is is very good uh, i'd rate it very highly actually yeah even the build quality of the device itself is quite high i was fearing that maybe it was going to feel flimsy mm -hmm. especially in the middle where the screen is and where the battery be housed 
but it has a little bit of thickness to it and it is nice hard plastic yeah and i'm glad that it is not a glossy plastic it is a matte type thing similar to the dual sense so you're not too concerned about fingerprints or anything like that mm-hmm. so that was a nice surprise especially when we saw them go glossy with the playstation 5 revision or the slim as some people refer to it so i'm glad that they stuck with the true matte type finish here because you don't want fingerprints all over any product absolutely now we can go into the games themselves and some of our impressions as we've been playing all types of different games experimenting to see what type of performance we could get out of this device and whether or not this device had justified its existence to us and for me i have an old phone i have a samsung galaxy s5 so a backbone was not a viable product for me While there are products I could have considered investing in, like the Logitech G or even a Steam Deck or even a ROG Ally, those products were always priced too highly for me. But when you came in at $200 with the PlayStation Portal, it felt as though it was a nice entry-level product. And it was still a gamble because it really came down to how well was it going to receive to my in-home network. So it was kind of that gamble and risk I was willing to take because if it happened to perform well this was going to be an exciting product and one that i would use for a considerable amount of time especially during football and sports season when i want to watch a you know the football game on a sunday monday or thursday or even watch a movie and such i just want to play a game in a more leisure setting so in comes the portal and we got to experiment with a wide array of games over the last day or so And I want to go to your impressions first to see what type of games you have been playing on your portal and your general impressions of how the the device has performed for you across these many different games. So I didn't really focus on any single game and I didn't really like, you know, go into the archives and try to install a bunch of new games to test with it. I just kind of took what I already had on my PS5 which consists of Spider-Man 2, RoboCop. I have a build of Shantae on there, which was something that was um, obviously something that that we had released with WayForward like a year ago, which is interesting because I, I do want to talk about 2D side-scrollers as well. Um, but the first game that I actually tried, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to go into this with a very open mind. Look, when it comes to streaming devices, there's always, I always have a, bit of hesitation around something like this i'm not like i said i'm not really the target demographic for something like this i've never used a backbone controller um i've barely touched the you know the remote play stuff that that sony has made available over the years and over the generations but i thought you know what i'm going to give this a go right for the sake of um you know doing some real world testing and as well as you know to basically come to this discussion with some some good information so i tested out resident evil 4 the separate ways dlc which was on my ps5 which i had purchased a few weeks ago and i hadn't gotten around to playing cuz i just beaten you know spider-man 2 and i started playing robocop so i'm playing through that so i thought i'm going to i'm going to play separate ways and to be honest, Nate, I was very, very impressed with the not only the visual fidelity, um, it was running mostly at 60 frames per second. There were definitely situations where you could see that there was a bit of lag or stutter that would that would crop up. Um, and it's usually when you're kind of, you know, if in a third person type game over the shoulder game, if you just kind of rotate the camera around the the player um you know with the with the analog stick you know you'll see a bit of that that jitter you know that 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 um jumpiness that that's associated with it but for the most part the frame rates were very very smooth um you know i beat the first you know three or four levels um in the game and it felt very very good to me uh it felt very good Uh, i was very very impressed with you know not only the way that it looked also the way that it ran I also tried out Spider-Man 2, which I know is kind of a, a lot of people are testing that right now. And overall, it felt very good as well. I will say that I did notice more in terms of artifacting with Spider-Man 2, and I'm not really sure why that is the case. Maybe it's just something that has to do with the way that geometry is rendered in Spider-Man 2. Um, 
but it it definitely showed more kind of those square artifacts that you kind of get, especially if you look into the horizon a little bit more you know if you're kind of swinging around in the city you'll definitely see it maybe it has to do with kind of the 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 a lot of pixels in motion um you know does sometimes trip up the the streaming i also tried um robocop as well which is on my ps5 that played great in fact out of all the games i tried i think robocop was the best one for me and I also tried Shantae, as mentioned. Again, 2D side-scroller. The game normally runs at 60 FPS. I will say that uh, for 2D side-scrollers, I'm not sure if the portal is the the move. And, and I'm not sure if you got a chance to to try a, two, a 2D side-scroller, but I'll definitely you know hear what you have to say here shortly. But with me, when I played Shantae, I, I expect, you know, fluid 60 FPS, smooth scrolling as you're kind of moving the character left and right. And there were definitely times where I could just see the, the frame rate just kind of judder and, and stutter. And it it really kind of bothered me a little bit. Um, but then I thought, well, hold on. Obviously, it's not the game. It's it's just the, um, it's the you know, it's the streaming that's, that's causing this. But I will say that in conclusion, I'm not sure if you want to play fast 2d games like a sonic or a, a shante or something that's kind of an old school 2d style um scrolling game so i think overall it's really more geared for you know the kind of the more modern 3d style games that that that, that are out these days right which the good news is that represents a lot of the playstation library but look nate overall again i was um I was, you know, pleasantly surprised with how well this thing actually worked. I will say that I was literally, you know, sitting about three feet away from my PS5 at the time when I was doing my tests. So I didn't actually get a chance to, you know, take it outside or take it in the backyard and test it there. Um, but overall, Nate, I was really, really happy with what it could do overall. It was um, a very, very good experience. What about you? Yeah, I, I tested a lot of games. I was looking to test some of the PlayStation 1, the PSP. I tested a few PS5 games as well. And the PS1 games I had tested were Ape Escape, mm -hmm. Twisted Metal, and there was one other. It was, I think it was Twisted Metal 2. And generally, I had no issues whatsoever in any of my play during them. And it was really surprising. It felt as though I was playing these games natively on the device and I was unlocking trophies and everything. And I was kind of thinking to myself, this is how I want to play these type of games. I don't want to play them sitting down at my TV on, you know, the OLED screen. Yeah. Because these are those smaller style games. They are really well suited for more of a leisure setting. And that's what the portal offered me here. And even with the PSP games that I had tested, which included Pursuit Force 1 and 2, they're kind of, you know, they're pretty fast-paced games in their own right. And it was also Killzone Liberation. Mm -hmm. yep. And I was going through that, and it played quite well on the portal as well. I didn't have any hiccups. I didn't have any disconnects. There was a little bit of a drop in quality at the start of Killzone. Yep. But again, I think that's just due to the connection and the in-home network environment it took a few seconds for it to recalibrate and came right back with a nice hd visual presentation on the screen and i never had any input lag at least nothing that was noticeable and again i wanted to do something like a pursuit force where you did have to rely a bit on your input and your reactions because if you're arresting an enemy in pursuit force 2 you have to do a quick time event where you have to hit the face buttons in a certain sequence to capture that. And if you're too slow, you will fail it. And I was performing these without issue. And then the real test came to the PS5 games. And I want to be very select in what I was going to play when it came to PlayStation 5 games. So the first game I booted up was Demon Souls. Right. And... I chose Demon Souls because the inputs are very important in this game. You have to parry, you have to dodge. Even the window to attack is quite narrow, so you really have to execute as well as you can. You have to take advantage of that very small opportunity. And I played it for about 20 minutes just to see how it would perform and get a feel. And 
it felt as close to native as you can get on a streaming device. I was blown away by what I was seeing here. I was parrying the enemy. I was getting behind them, doing that critical damage attack to them. And it was kind of a moment of just stop and saying, wow, I'm playing Demon Souls on a portable device. Yeah. And like similar to you, I am still playing it within my house. This was play. I was laying in bed and I was like, this is where I want to test this out at least in these first few days, just to see, will it function well so I can lay down at night when I'm tired and I just want to play a game for a half hour or so before I go to sleep. I then tried The Last of Us Part Two. Mm-hmm. You know, again, a game that now has been patched to 60 FPS on the PlayStation 5, that you could always play it at 30 FPS. And it played very well. I didn't have any hiccups with that either. I would say there was a slight bit more of a parent of an input lag in some spots but again that can come down to the in-home network just having a slight hiccup or packet loss that led to that input lag right but it was nothing that led to a death or really a missed shot it was just a momentary stutter and then it picked up and resumed play as though nothing had happened i had also played slipstream which is a PlayStation 4 game, and it's very similar to OutRun. So it is a pixelated style game, very fast moving. The environments, you know, the foreground and everything is just racing by you. And it performed, again, admirably. It felt native in terms of the input and everything. And from these experiments and tests with these games, I really just had to sit there and say, okay, what style game is going to be well-suited for me to play in this setting? Because when I think of games like, as you mentioned, Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 2 with all of its visual wonder and luster, that's something I'm going to want to experience to, and in its full glory on the OLED TV at right. 4K with ray tracing, HDR, all that visual flair and effect. So you can really become immersed. But in other games, like I mentioned with PS1, PSP, even certain PS4 games. Well, again, I also, I also played Shenmue. Mm -hmm. the ps4 hd version and you know it's a slower style game but that ran without hiccup and this is a game that i am working on a platinum in and having tested it out for about half an hour i made the decision i will platinum shenmue 1 and shenmue 2 solely on the portal like it not not because they're not like visually very pleasing games but it's not a game that's really taking advantage of hdr and all those extra types of visual flair that need or necessitate the use of an OLED. These are games I can sit back, play in my leisure and really take in. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here. So based on these tests and these experiments, I'm quite pleased with what I'm getting out of the PlayStation portal during admittedly the honeymoon phase, but I don't see any reason why the experience would deteriorate in any meaningful time or in the immediate, because If I'm getting these results now, and it's really just based, again, on your in-home network, there's no reason to assume it would become worse. Yeah, I want to do uh, touch on a couple of things you said. First of all, I didn't get any dropouts either. I know that uh, I've seen some reviews of people saying that, you know, they've had some random dropouts here and there. I never experienced any, and I've, I've been playing it. I think I've used the portal for about a total for of about seven or eight hours now. Um, so I've I've not experienced any dropouts yet, um, but yeah, I think to your point, there's definitely there's definitely use cases where I think the portal is is almost the go to for something. But I also agree with you that there's going to be situations where if there is a a new game that's come out, you want to enjoy it and experience it on your you know on your big television with. And you know, if you have 120 hertz, if you have HDR, if you have ray tracing, if you have VRR, all that stuff, all the all the cool stuff. I mean, you want to experience it. You don't really want to take that away from the experience, you know, by using it on the portal. But I do think there are many games that really does suit the portal. And yeah, I mean, that whole idea of taking this thing with you, as long as you have a good, you know, Wi-Fi connection that you can play any game that's currently installed on your PS5 is really, really compelling. Like, to be honest, I never really felt like this thing was something that 
I, I felt, you know, it would be more than a passing curiosity. But in my head, and, and the thing that you said about, you know, you took it to bed with you or, you know, you take it, take it around the house with you, it's definitely something that has given me a lot of thought about, you know, how I'd like to use this going forward. But look, overall, the games that I tried were were very good. They weren't perfect. You know, there's definitely some issues here and there. And look, there's going to be, I think there's going to be some games that you just don't recommend the portal for at all. And I'm thinking about games like Street Fighter VI, right? I'm thinking about games like Mortal Kombat. Yes, you can probably get away with some casual games, um, but you don't want to get online and start, you know, um, doing ranked matches, for example, because I feel like if you're doing that on the portal, you it's it, you, it's going <laughs> to end badly for you, let's be honest. But overall, look, I definitely did detect some latency, um, maybe more than what you did. I don't, I'm not sure if it's just the nature of your Wi-Fi compared to mine. But look, overall, I think the portal does exactly what it's you know advertised to do. Yeah, it delivers a streamed PlayStation 5 experience. And depending, again, on the game you are looking to play on it, and again, you're in-home networking, you can find a very reasonable and well-tuned product here for you to use to play in your leisure, to sit on the couch and play a game while you're watching a movie, maybe while you're watching the Game Awards in a couple of weeks or... yeah any type of product that you consume and that's where this product has that market that's who it's trying to appeal to and yes there is a lot of competition now with things like the rog ally the logitech g the steam deck the backbone and such but if you you know maybe those are too expensive for you and you do have a good in-home network this is a viable product and if it caters to those specific needs and they are a very specific niche need admittedly yeah but this, if this is something that does cater to you where you want to play in leisure and you want to be able to just relax and lounge on the couch where your playstation 5 is not i'd say right now it is delivered on that promise but there are some issues with the device as it stands right now and as you mentioned you know a few things with the latency or some of the artifacting and such there are also some there are some issues, but there are pros. And one of them I want to say is the screen. It's not an OLED screen. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have HDR. But I have to say, this eight inch LCD impressed me very much. So um, it really, really pops. And one thing that I really like about this this display is that it's got a fantastic viewing angle kind of range. Because, you know, normally if you're looking at things on the side, you know, things tend to kind of fade out if you're not looking at it face on. But look, it's a it's a very nice screen. It's probably the best IPS panel I've seen uh, at, at that kind of size, you know, that smaller uh, handheld size. But yeah, definitely impressive as well. Um, overall, very, very happy with, with, the, with the display. And just makes you wonder, doesn't it? You know, if, if the next Switch has an eight inch display, and we get something like this. I mean, I'd be I'd be pretty happy. I'd be pretty happy. I mean, I know people are saying oh, I'd rather have OLED and all that stuff, but if this is what the next Switch launches with a, a screen that's like eight inches and it's comparable to this, man, sign me up because that would be that would be awesome. Mm-hmm. Now, some of the cons of the device are. I don't want to say they're in any way ruining or a deterrent in purchasing this product but they are of note and have to be mentioned and we'll start with the screen is that because the it is a streaming device it doesn't have any i guess it doesn't default to the screen options of just being a 1080p 60 fps display it will automatically go to you know a 4k image and then if it if you happen to have your system set to 120 fps and hdr and such on your playstation 5 that is what it's trying to output to this device yeah and that is leading to some jittering and stutter while you're playing it and the device really needs to have an option where it just disables those types of features that it doesn't support because there's no reason for 
trying to force in HDR. There's no reason for trying to convert even 40 megahertz performance onto the 60 megahertz screen. It doesn't it doesn't translate and it's leading to some performance issues you can manually go into the game and change these features and you will be able to improve your performance but just the idea that you have to do this and there's no means in through communication that it's just addressed yeah i mean i definitely feel like you know i mean it's it's kind of the playstation way right like when the ps5 launched you could tell that it was coming in relatively hot. The the kind of the version one firmware that was on the kind of the original systems wasn't fully fleshed out. There were bugs. I in fact I went I went back and watched my PlayStation 5 review from three years ago when the system came out. And I guess I don't really remember how many bugs there were. Like there was remember there was issues with putting the system in rest mode. Because when when you would restart it, it would rebuild the database, and sometimes your you know your games library would get corrupted. There was all sorts of you know weird crashes and things that would happen, and it was just overall a little bit of a mess. I think that the portal is similar in that regard. It's not it's not that it's it's buggy or in any way. I think it it's not at all. In fact, it's quite stable. But there's definitely some features that I feel like need to get either suppressed or, um, you know, adjusted. If you are running, you know, the, re- the remote viewer and you have the portal connected to the PlayStation 5, it should know what, you know, settings options and what uh, specific system options need to either be, uh, you know, just hidden because they don't apply or or changed in some way to you know take more advantage of the portal itself so i think we'll start to see that um happen you know over time and hopefully we'll start to see you know fairly regular firmware updates where it does not only introduce more features for the portal but like you said it it also eliminates some of that confusion and some of those settings that really just don't fit right with the portal itself so hopefully we'll start to see that over the you know the next few months or so one thing that did stand out for me during my playstation one and psp testing is the touch screen of the portal is kind of it's unresponsive in in my testing and you have two specific spots on the screen that serve as the start and select buttons in these PS1 and PSP game. So any legacy game has these two spots that you'd have to press Mm -hmm. to hit those corresponding buttons. And I had to mash them to get them to respond. So I'm just sitting there tapping the screen, hoping that it does recognize I'm hitting start and I can begin the game or I can pause the game and such. So it feels as though maybe the device's touchscreen needs a little bit of tuning. And I would imagine maybe they can address this via a firmware update and i wouldn't mind if they just made the entire touchscreen itself be it on its corresponding half right function as a start or select screen because even some of the playstation 5 games if you have to use the touchpad you have to use the touchscreen here and if it's not responsive that's just going to create moments of minor frustration and annoyance because that shouldn't be the case so that's something i want them to iron out as the system matures a bit more in the coming months They also have to enable the option to remap the buttons because when you play on your PlayStation 5 with a DualSense, you can remap the buttons. That is not a feature or an option on the portal as a native option right now. So that's something they definitely have to address as well. They also have an issue when it comes to using public Wi-Fi. Yes. Yes. This is uh, is kind of... I don't know if it's a, a showstopper or a deal breaker, but it's definitely going to be something that does make the portal a little less portal portable than what we would have liked. <laughs> and, you know, I guess to, to elaborate on what Nate's saying, because there is no uh, built-in web browser, that means if you connect to a hotel or public Wi-Fi, you, normally there is a some type of, login page or a disclaimer page that you have to accept terms of services with before you can actually get connected to the wi-fi unfortunately 
I don't think that's going to work because there is no web browser. So if you go to any hotel and try to connect to um, you know, the Wi-Fi, because the the web page never appears, you're never able you're never going to be able to get connected. Now, there are workarounds for something like this. You can, you know, try to set up a hotspot maybe from a laptop or something. But the difficulty with that is once you start bringing in another piece of equipment into the mix, then your signal strength and your, you know, your packet loss and your jitter, all those things start to, um, you know, become more apparent. So I, I am curious to, to test, you know, real world testing of the portal uh, when it comes to connecting to public Wi-Fi. And I'm, in fact, I'm going to get a chance to do that next week when I'm, when I'm kind of uh, taking a bit of a vacation for Thanksgiving week. But uh, yeah, at the moment, it is a bit of a bummer that there is no, um, you know, web, web browser. I'm not sure why Sony hasn't done that, probably for security reasons, uh, if I was to guess, but it would be nice if we had a way to do that. Now, but correct me if I'm wrong, Nate, Ninten the Nintendo Switch had a similar thing, correct? I mean, you can't just connect to any hotel Wi-Fi on a Switch because you're going to get a similar thing, right? Yeah, I believe that was an issue in the early days. I'm not sure if they ever had rectified it or if it was just a case where people had hacked the Switch and they were able to access the browser yeah. to force it into that situation. My mm. memory is a bit fuzzy on that at the moment. I mean, it's a different scenario because all you really want to do is get your Switch online, um, but you're not you know, streaming games um, wirelessly to it. So it's really more about getting that, establishing that connection, you know, um, and then kind of going from there, maybe playing some, you know, online games. But this is a different use case because you're literally just, you know, beaming over um, all this data, you know, to your device. So having a, a good connection that doesn't drop packets is is definitely paramount. So uh, I am curious to see what the real world tests are with, you know, with public Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also didn't get a chance to test it, you know, out in the yard or away from home. And honestly, 99.9% .9 of my play is going to be in home anyway. So that type of testing was never a priority to me, but yeah. I am going to be curious to see the type of results that you net being able to play the portal. Yep thousands or hundreds of miles away from your base ps5 using the internet and such i'm going to be curious about your results there and if it works well because if it does work well i may have to consider this when i go to you know family out of state or anything and bring the portal with me connect to their internet and say hey i'm trying to platinum spider-man 2 you mm -hmm. just have to wait yeah but i mean <laughs> i think for me look i think if if you can actually take this on the road with you and you do get a good experience somewhere else, that's definitely very compelling for me. All of a sudden, having the ability to remote kind of access my PlayStation 5 at home, you know, turn it on and all that, um, and then, you know, play games on it, there's definitely uh, a lot of appeal, you know, to do that. So, yeah, next week I'll be on the road. I'm going to test it out uh, in various places, and look, hopefully it'll it'll offer a good experience. I, I am I am you know quietly confident that it'll get the job done. Um, I have heard some stories about people already doing this, and it's been a good experience. But of course, nothing beats your own you know experiences and thoughts. So I'll definitely give it a try next week and see you know how how it performs. But yeah, if it performs mm -hmm. well. Um, it's probably something I may, you know, keep in, in my luggage and take with me on the road because I mean, it's something that I never really felt like was too interesting, but the more that you kind of think about the portal, the more use cases and the more, the more appeal that it certainly has, at least for myself. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things that it does have an issue with is that it, doesn't really, it's not a greatly equipped multi-user system out of the box. While you can have multiple users use a portal, the issue is, is that when you log off and log out of your account, you have to go through the entire initial setup process again Ooh. for the account that would then be in use. I so it's kind of convoluted. I didn't know that. That's That's interesting to hear you say that. I kind of felt like, well, I mean, yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? 
now that I think about it, you'd probably have to do that. But yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a miss in my opinion. So really what, what, what Sony's really telling us is it's kind of like one portal per person per household right like essentially you don't really kind of share it around because you have to basically log out log back in and it's right it's a whole it's a whole thing to do so generally speaking you you have each person that that wants a portal has the portal i guess Mm -hmm. yeah that's now that's interesting now there is one issue with it that i do have when it comes to design and i know you also share the same sentiment it is the placement of the charging dock. It yeah. is in the most obscure, hard to reach location on the device. Because instead of being on the top of the system, it is along the bottom of the system. But it's not as the, it's not like the switch where the bottom of the system is the bottom of the screen. No, there is an indentation halfway up on the screen, and that is where you will plug in the charging cable. And it's kind of awkward to access it's very awkward to access it reminds me of an old computer that i used to have back in the day called the atari st you would lay it it was just like a desktop computer you would put it on its table but the mouse port for whatever reason was on the underside of the case so you'd have to lift the case from its front legs to get access to this mouse port that was at the (laughs) back of the computer And this is what that reminds me of. The portal has a similar thing where the USB-C connection is really wedged up there at kind of, you know, on the backside of of the portal, which is concealed by that kind of that black piece of plastic, right? So I do wish they could have aligned or, you know, had that in a better spot, maybe on top, but... Look, we haven't really seen any of the portal accessories, if that is something that Sony will um, unveil. I'm hoping that there is some type of dock that fits with this thing, so you can basically just have it on your uh, entertainment stand where you just dock it and that's charging, you know. But I do agree the placement of the USB-C connector is very curious to me. I personally wouldn't have had it there, but... Hey, um, Sony, I'm sure, has their reasons for it. Yeah, I hope so. And it's not a con per se, but due to the size of the screen, you definitely need to invest in a screen protector. You do. Um, yeah, I. it goes back to the screen itself. Like, this is not a, a cheap screen, you know, and I think that was one of the things that really um, surprised me when I unboxed it and turned it on. It was like, this screen is actually really, really good, a lot better than I thought it would be. And the first kind of th- thought you have in your mind is, well, I don't want to, I don't want to even put my fingerprints on this, but you, you know, you will obviously because it's a touch screen and you want to yep. make use of it. But yeah, the next thought is, I need to protect this screen from scratches, and it's something I feel like could very easily get scratched, could very easily get beaten up, especially if you kind of drop the portal. Um, I could definitely see, you, you know, scratching up this screen pretty easily because it's it's very big. It takes up a lot of real estate. So, yeah, you definitely want to invest in the screen protector. And hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll see some aftermarket ones that fit the size here pretty soon. And my final con, not sure if you'll have any additional ones to add here, but my final con is the speakers are loud yeah. And they're also not great quality. They're, they're, they're terrible. Let's be honest. I don't like the speakers. Um, and just to kind of add to that a little, obviously there's no Bluetooth uh, on, on this device, which does limit the headphones that you can use with this thing, uh, which does really annoy me because I do have Sony Pulse headphones, the original ones. And of course they are not supported. Um, look, I don't like the speakers very much and I don't like the fact that, you know, you have to really work hard to get this, you know, pair of headphones on this thing. Yeah, you can use kind of wired headphones, but who uses wired headphones in 2023? I do. Do do you have wired headphones? I do. Well, you're you're in luck because I don't. (laughs) Um, And I'm going to have to figure out a way to get some headphones on on this thing. And I don't want to spend more money getting these new portal 
uh, well, there's new uh, pulse headset thingies that support the portal. Um, so maybe I will go old school and get the headphones, you know, a wide uh, headphones out and, and do it that way. <laughs> but man, I mean, don't like the speakers very much. And I don't like the fact that they don't allow you to pair up your existing pulse headphones or any other Bluetooth headphones for that matter on this device. I think it's a mess. Yeah, the speakers are set up along the top of the device and they're just very low quality speakers in terms of audio quality. Now, that's the curious thing is that when you have the audio set to, let's just say one notch above off, Mm -hmm. it's loud. Very loud. I I was playing, I was like, this is very loud. And I went to go turn it down and it went to zero. And I was like, okay. So I was kind of curious and I went to full blast. I was like, okay, that's, that's ridiculous. That's way too loud. And I still end up settling at just above being completely turned off as my comfort zone of volume which I guess you could say is a testament to it saying, hey, even at low volume, you're getting pretty amplified sound. But at the same time, it's if this is where I think it's too loud and my only other option is turning it off, that's yeah. also not very rewarding. I haven't used my wired headphones on the device yet. I will be doing that tonight to see how how loud it is in a headphone setting. So I'm curious to learn what those results are going to be. And we kind of went on a long list of cons, but really it may have sounded like a lot of things, but most of these are really minor things at the end of the day. Right. It doesn't detract or distract from the use of the product itself because the overall experience so far has been very promising. And it leads into the topic of stock. As you took note today, this might be kind of being sold secondhand at a markup. Yeah. I looked around because I did read some reports that the portal had sold out, which surprised me a bit. Um, not not because, you know, that's that's a, a surprise in itself. There's obviously when there's, it seems like anytime there's a new Sony product that's announced, um, you know, scalpers will, will jump in and buy up as many as they can, hoping to drive up the cost of this. But I did look around on major outlets and yeah, it's sold out pretty much everywhere at the moment. And if you look at eBay, anywhere from $300 to $400 is the going price that resellers are selling the portal for, which is a bit of a shame because I feel like stock probably won't get replenished until sometime next year. So if you didn't get a portal, it may be very difficult to get one between now and the end of the year, unless you're willing to pay ridiculous prices on eBay, which I don't wish that on, on anyone. Don't do that. But yeah, um, it's uh, it's sold out pretty much uh, across the board at the moment and hoping we'll get some more stock. But I think, you know, based on, on the past, it's probably unlikely, Nate, until next year. Yeah, because you have to imagine this type of unit, just given that it is a niche product, that Sony wasn't mass producing these in the quantities of millions of systems. Mm-hmm. They know that this is a this is a boutique item, yeah. and they know that, and they're going to just produce as they see the need for. So if it is indeed selling out right now, maybe we get a secondary shipment just ahead of Christmas as we get deeper into the holiday season. But it is a shame that once again, you know, scalpers and such are taking advantage of the opportunity and trying to sell it for double the price on eBay and other type of online storefronts. So ideally, do do not give them the money. Continue to go to Best Buy, Target, Amazon, check them for stock, or even the PlayStation Direct store, see if they get a replenishment and pay the sticker price. Do not pay a higher than premium price for this product right now. While you may say, wow, I don't want to miss out, stock will come. Yeah. You'll be able to experience it and it will still deliver the same experience as what we're getting today. But now to go into what this video title is, has the PlayStation portal in your experience so far, do you think it's going to change any of your buying habits? And do you think this could potentially be a replacement or the Nintendo Switch in your life when it comes to select games? And will it change those buying habits of Switch games, Xbox games, or even PC games for you? 
That is a really good question. I think it's easy just to disregard it and say there's no way that the switch would ever be replaced with something like this. But I, I definitely get where you're coming from. And a good example is a game such as, you know, that's kind of cross uh, platform where you could buy a Switch version of it and have a good experience in a hybrid capacity, but you could get a overall better experience on the portal because you have access to higher resolutions and higher frame rates and you have access to, you know, things like haptics and all that stuff that take advantage of the PlayStation 5. I think to answer the question, Nate, um, it's a little it's a little on the fence, but I'm going to say on a case-by-case -case basis. I feel like there's definitely going to be some games where I feel like would be more suited for the portal. And in that regard, I probably would jump on a PlayStation 5 version so I can actually play it exclusively on the portal. I've done that before with the Steam Deck. There are there are games that um, you know that, that are on Steam that are also on the Switch. And I feel like a Steam Deck version would be overall a better experience than the Switch version because again, it would run better. So I think for me, it would really be a case of, you know, take take each game on its merits. Where do I feel like I'm going to enjoy playing this game the best? Sometimes I'm going to just say, I think the Switch version is the go-to, but there may be situations where I kind of jump to the portal and say, I think I want to play this game on the portal because I, I feel like this is the, the right way to play this game. Yeah, I'm kind of finding myself in a similar situation because when I look at a recent release from Square Enix with Star Ocean, a fantastic remake of a fantastic Star Ocean game, you, a month ago I would have had to weigh those types of considerations of do I want to play this in a portable setting or do I want to play it on my OLED, you know, my television mm -hmm. in the best visual fidelity possible with the best performance. So it'd be, should I buy it on the PlayStation or should I buy it on the Switch? Knowing that I can get a quality experience out of the portal in my home setting, I now have to revisit that type of decision and say, well, if I buy the PlayStation version, I'm going to get the best console experience with the best visuals and performance. And if I want to play it in a portable, setting i now have that option available to me and i can go in with confidence that it's going to perform well on the portal so now that switch version is kind of moot to yeah. me i don't need to make that decision and it's definitely going to be a case-by-case -case basis depending on the game but that could become more and more apparent as future releases come and this also extends to the xbox as well Definitely. when it comes to a multi-platform game i have to weigh what the game is if it's going to be something that is visually spectacular something like alan wake 2 that's going to come down to kind of that controller preference and maybe the performance on the two consoles themselves right so i might sit there and say okay well the xbox has the edge in terms of overall performance i like how that controller would feel with the asymmetric sticks i'm going to buy the xbox version but there could be other cases of a cross gen or cross platform game where i'm going to say you know what the ps5 version and the xbox version are one-to-one -one, but i have the option of playing this in a casual setting i think i'm going to pick it up on the playstation because i know i will enjoy it on the portal device and i it's early to say will it change my buying habits because it's only been a few days but i can see that possibility becoming a strong consideration for future software purchases for me again depending on what the game is so like when Hollow Knight Silk Song is finally dated for an announce or a release date, yeah, it may never come, but ideally it does. I now have to weigh that decision of do I get it on Switch, do I get it on the Xbox, or do I get it on the PlayStation? We know it's going to be a Game Pass Day One game that was announced well over a year ago, right? And when I had played Hollow Knight on my Switch, it was primarily in portable mode. Mm -hmm. Now with the portal. I have to consider the PlayStation version, but it's going to come down to when the game is finally given a release date and we get an update. What's the difference in terms of performance, visuals, and other features? Because if it's strictly, okay, it's 4K on the PlayStation 5 and 60 FPS, or it's 1080p and 60 FPS on the Switch, maybe I would still consider the Switch in that type of environmental setting. So 
that's kind of like an easy decision there. But you never know what other future games are coming up that are going to be across the Switch, Xbox, and PlayStation. But the portal is definitely going to make me sit back and consider all my options because I do enjoy gaming in that leisure sitting back setting of just being able to kick it and play in a handheld type environment. So if the game I feel is well suited for it, and I think a lot of Square Enix games will fall in that category. So something like a Final Fantasy Tactics Remaster. Yep. I would likely pick it up on PlayStation over a Switch release because the portal will give me that option there. And I know it's going to perform better on the PlayStation 5 than the Switch or even titles that had come out previous, be it something like Triangle Strategies Mm -hmm. or numerous other games that maybe now had I skipped and I'm looking back at saying, hmm, where would I get it now? Because it's cheap, it's on sale. PlayStation might now take that edge. So in a way, I'm not going to say it's fully replacing the Switch, but in select games, it may end up becoming that replacement for the Switch. And it also would be the replacement for the Xbox in very select cases as well. Right. So Sony kind of has a trump card in their hand here where it's going to be get the 4K HDR ray tracing, all the bells and whistles when you're playing on your TV and also have the option of playing it wherever you want with the portal that Xbox doesn't have an answer to. And Nintendo can't fully counter because they don't have that type of horsepower. Yeah, I mean, while you were kind of mentioning it, I, I was thinking about games that I have bought on the Switch that I probably would have gotten on the PS5 instead for the um, the Portal. And a couple of do that, that do come to mind would be the Red Dead Redemption game that came out for the Switch earlier this year. Um, I really wanted it portably. But obviously the PS4 version has the 60 FPS mode. And I feel like overall the portal would be much more suited for me to have that game. So that was, that's probably something that I think if the portal was out at the time, I probably wouldn't have got the switch version. I probably would have got the PlayStation version to play on the portal. And another one, um, look would be, you know, the metal gear solid collection, same, same reasons overall, It's a better version on the PS5. You get 60 FPS uh, for the games, except for the first one, of course. So overall, you know, if I'm going to play the Metal Gear Solid collection, I think I'd rather play it on the portal over something like the Nintendo Switch. So very, very good point that you bring up. I think, you know, overall, there's, there's definitely going to be games where, you know, rather than just jump on the Switch version because you want a portable version to take with you, now you have... It's almost like a third pillar. You know, there are there are obviously there are other products like the ROG Ally and the Lenovo and all that. But let's kind of you know think about the Switch, the Steam Deck, and the uh, the Portal. You know, now it's like a a situation where I have to decide where I want to play my games. Like even another example would be something like Baldur's Gate Three. That's you know obviously available for the PS Five. But do you get the portal version now? Do you get the PS5 version to play on your portal, which would be a better experience than running the Steam Deck version on your Steam Deck? So I think you bring up some really good points. And having the choice to really kind of make a decision about how you want to play your games and and where you want to play them is is kind of awesome. And I think overall, it's nothing but good for the, the consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, now you do have that option of being able to play your PlayStation games on the go, and you're not getting a limited version like what we would have seen during the PSP or even the PlayStation Vita days where you're getting down ports of these home console games. You're getting the pure PlayStation 5 game. So when it comes time for something like MLB The Show, you want to play it on your portal, it's the PlayStation 5 version. You're not getting a lesser version, something like what the Switch version would be. Yep. So. The consumer is able to win here. It really just comes down again. Is this device well tailored for your lifestyle and your in-home network? Because if it does cater to your lifestyle, if you do have the in-home network and the internet connection strength to make this a viable product for you, it's definitely something that PlayStation owners have to consider as it does deliver 
on what it sets out to do is a few things that they need to refine here and there. But overall, as we just said, there's going to be cases moving into the future where we're going to look at cross-platform games and say, which version is better suited for my lifestyle now? Which platform is going to cater to every specific need? And in some cases, the PlayStation 5 version will now have that advantage thanks to Portal offering us that handheld portable experience that otherwise the Switch would have had exclusively when it comes to these three console manufacturers. Right Now Sony is competing, not in a direct one-to-one way, but still competing. And that's the thing, like a lot of people will position the Portal and the Switch as direct competitors, and that would be an inaccurate and a fallacy to do. This is an accessory. This is complementary to your PlayStation 5. It is not the core feature. It's also something Sony can't potentially not support it's going to be something that they have to support yep. even if it is in indir- they don't have to make games or anything for it so there's no extra leverage for them to worry about there it's really just a net win for them but it is competing with the switch in the sense of the playstation xbox and switch are all competing for your time and now if you have the option of being able to play playstation 5 games on the go you have to consider whether or not you pick up that Switch version of a third-party game or do you pick it up on the PlayStation and play it on the go with the portal. And that extends to the Xbox. So it's a very interesting new world of gaming we have here. And I'm very surprised that the portal was able to deliver on the promise of streaming games in a high-quality nature i really expected to get this unbox it and have a mess on my hands expect except i'm walking away pleasantly surprised and now questioning future releases and what platform i'm going to be purchasing games for absolutely agree i i question the use case for this thing who was this for who who even would use something like this why would you even bother having this in your home when you just have your PlayStation 5 anyway. And I never really could get my head around, you know, the whole point of something like this, right? But the more that I've used it and, you know, the way that it does what it's advertised to do and the fact that, you know, with a good Wi-Fi connection, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can technically connect to your home PlayStation 5 or the one that's paired up with and play games is very very compelling to me um like i said it's something that i am now thinking about just throwing in the in the luggage and and you know taking with me on the road next year right um so i think this product you know there's definitely a a, a market for it there's definitely people that would want something like this and to be honest I've been educated, you know, like I, I never really believed that this was was something that that really made much difference in the grand scheme of things. And look, at the end of the day, it may still be, like you said, a niche product, a, a boutique product. But overall, I'm very pleasantly surprised with the portal. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to stick with it, at least for a while. And, and um, hopefully it's something that becomes, you know, part of my, you know, my video game workflow. And we'll we'll, we'll have to see just how it all kind of pans out over the next like 12 months or so. But I'm I'm excited about it. I think it's a really cool product and I'm hoping that Sony continues to support it. You know, they they iterate upon the um the design. Uh they continue to update its firmware and offer features. Give us the browser, please. The browser would be awesome. And look, another I think another thing that it doesn't do and I think this is intentional is it doesn't stream any of your movies. So anything on your media tab on your PlayStation 5 just doesn't work. So I've tried, you know, the different different apps. Um, but look, open it up, you know, maybe add some more features as well. I think you've got a uh, you've got a really, really cool thing on your hands here, Sony. So overall, very, very surprised with it and a great job. I can't wait to see, you know, where it goes. Mm-hmm. I mean, we both went from, who is this product for? Why would anyone buy this? To being fans of the product and questioning future yep. software purchases. So I'd say, Sony, you have a net win here. Ideally, for anyone listening who has interest in this product, you 
will get a similar experience as we have. Again, the performance of this is going to depend on your internet and such, so and your in-home network. So our testimony can only reflect our experience at this time. It yep. may not match yours one-to-one. You could fare far better than us. You could fare worse. It's really, it's really a device that there is no universal answer. Yep. Absolutely. And with that, we go into some of the Streamlabs questions for this week. And our first comes from Optimus Pledge. Donated $1.96 and writes, Hey, Nate and MVG, just want to thank you guys for the many hours of entertainment and information. I have a few questions, but I'm not going to be stingy and ask them all in one donation. Question one, should remakes be considered for game of the year? I say yes, but not remasters. Remakes should be, and they have been. Remasters should not be, but I think with the you know, the increase in remakes over the last five or so years, maybe they want to add a and another category for it. I feel like there's enough meat there to have a, a remasters category, but remakes should definitely be in the conversation. I mean, you're literally remaking a game and, you know, there's no reason why it shouldn't be in the conversation if it's good enough, in my opinion. And we had a follow-up question from Optimus Pledge of $1.96. Question two, how did this partnership between you and MVG come about? I think we were on the Spawncast about three and a half years ago now. And I don't know how we got into the conversation of it, but we basically started talking and said, maybe we should do our own show uh, and kind of go deeper on some of these topics because... Some of the topics on the Spawncast, uh, for whatever reason, can get lost in some of the um, just the shenanigans that go on on the show, especially when there's like nine people on there. And we kind of felt like we wanted to tackle some topics a little deeper and make them a, a little more serious, let's, let's say. Uh, I think that's fair to say. So we just decided that we would kind of just, you know, do a longer form podcast of some of the interesting topics in video games. And I think that's how it all started. So is, yeah, that, I think, is that fair? Did I miss anything? Yeah, I think the first topic that came up was I said the console wars are over and you said the console wars are still ongoing. And we said, you know what? We'll go over here. We'll have that conversation. Yep. We'll really dive deep into it. We'll debate that topic. And then after that, we're like, hey, we can... We can do this every week. We can, That's right. We can do topics that we choose. We can go deep in them. We can have that mature adult conversation about them. And it's something people have clearly enjoyed over the years. As we near 23,000 subscribers on YouTube, more on Spotify and iTunes and such. And I mean, as much of a journey as it has been for us, everyone who listens to us has been on this journey as well. And you are the reason we continue to go on this journey so thank you to everyone who continues to support us yeah absolutely then had a follow-up question from optimus pledge of a dollar 96 with question three is it true you have an issue with putting your face on youtube or is rgt stirring the pot as usual haha <laughs> if so do you think it limits your success on youtube it's not so much that I have an issue with it. It's really just for privacy sake. Um, one part of it was also I want to conduct a social experiment a few years ago where there is a belief, especially among like politicians and such, is that if you see a handsome face or an attractive face, you're more willing to believe what they are telling you because you're then basing it on their looks and not what they're saying. So my social experiment in my own mind was going to be, if you can't see me, all you can do is hear me. Are you going to believe what I'm saying to you more or less due to me being a non-physical entity? When, you know, as time just went on, it just became an easier decision of not going on camera and such. But 
I don't think it has limited success on YouTube only because I don't approach YouTube and its content with the goal of finding massive success. I find what we're doing now to be successful. We have a very committed, loyal, engaged base. And every single person who does come to the channel comments on our discussions and engages in the conversation with us. I'm you know, I recognize the names. I'm able to interact with you directly because we have a tight knit community, even with nearing again, 23,000 subscribers. I like being able to have that small community. And I feel as though being at what we're at right now is successful. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the podcast has grown organically over the last three or so years and it's been fantastic. I mean, we're not here trying to, um, you know, shock you with clickbait topics and, and conversation and stuff. We're just here to to really just talk about, you know, the, the topics that we're interested in. And, you know, um, mm -hmm. we uh, really, really appreciate all the support that we've had over the years. And we're not really planning on going away anytime soon either. I think we're going to continue to do this as long as we can going forward. Yeah, you know, continue to do it. And I mean, we'll find whatever success comes our way. And hey, maybe one day if we get to 100,000 subscribers. I will appear on camera. Oh, better here Let's... first, everyone. <laughs> Hold Nate to that. All of a sudden, we'll net 75,000 new subscribers in like the next month. And I'll be like, oh, man. <laughs> Let's get Nate the hate to 100K. I'll have to go to the barber, get my beard lined up, make sure my hair is perfectly trimmed. So I'm going to appear on camera. Can't look, you know, kind of look like me. Shoveled. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? People say you look good for your age. Oh, I do. I, I think I look good for my age. It's that good Greek jeans. Then had our final question for the week from Optimus Pledge with another $1.96 with question four. This one's for MVG. Hit me. You're a bit older than most of the people I see on Spawncast and YouTubers I watch in general. I'm 37 and have considered starting up a channel because I try and learn as much as I can about the industry for fun. Am I too old? No. I started doing YouTube probably when I was... All right, let's do the math here. I, the channel I started in 2007, but... Like I started really making content in 2016, right? So what, what are we talking about here? That's seven years ago now. Is that right? Is my math good? So what, yep. that, that would put me at what, 40, 43. So mm -hmm. my, my YouTube really started, you know, getting serious at 43. I probably didn't start like, and I'm using air quotes, blowing up until I was about 45, maybe 46. So, I mean, you're never too old to do something that you're passionate about. And look, I think anyone that wants to do YouTube that's listening to this, just, just do it. You know, don't overthink it. Don't overanalyze it. Don't worry about all the people that say it's too congested or it's too saturated these days. You, no one's going to care, all that stuff. Just have fun, you know, ha have fun doing it. This podcast, we started because we we wanted to just to chat, like, yeah, we wanted people to listen in and, and, and maybe, you know, learn something from it. But overall, I mean, we weren't out there trying to um, build a brand. You know, the, the, the whole goal of YouTube is, in, in my opinion, is just to make content, have fun. And if success and, you know, clicks and, and things come along the way, because, you know, if you continue to do what you do, you stick to your craft, you have a plan, um, you know, you will get a, a following. Now, that following may be 100 people. It could be 1,000. It could be 100,000. It could be a million. But look, I think the goal is just have fun and don't worry about, you know, starting a channel if you're like in your late 30s um, because there's going to be a demographic out there that is going to want to watch what you do. Like if I look at my demographics, yes, you know, my, my biggest kind of a, uh, audience is, you know, I think it's like 30 to 40 year olds because that's, that's kind of where I'm kind of at. I'm a little older than that, of course, but at the end of the day, just, just have fun, you know, start the channel up, make, make the content and um, yeah, 
let us know uh, when you do and, and what your channel is. We'll take a look at it. Yeah, absolutely good advice. You're never too old to start a passion project. And as MVG said, do it for fun. Do it for the love of what you're doing and success will follow. And if you don't focus on success and you just enjoy what you're doing, that's a very rewarding part in and of itself. As he said, we started this with really no goal in terms of a subscriber level. I think there were times we sat there and said, hey, if we get to 10,000 subscribers, that's a huge win. We're doing long form once a week podcasts. Yeah, I mean, we um we weren't monetized for a while. I think it took about 20 or so videos or episodes uh-huh. before we got monetized. So, you know, there's it just, you know, have fun is really the, the key thing. Yeah, have fun and do it because you want to do it. I mean, we we started this and we continue to do it because we enjoy being able to sit down once a week, maybe twice a week, and having the conversations that we share with you. We're not having these conversations out of an obligation or anything. We sit down and say, what do you think about this topic? We lay out a general outline of key points that we may want to touch on. And we're just having a genuine, authentic conversation with each other and the listening audience. And that's why we continue to do it. If there ever got a time where, you know, MVG and myself hated talking to each other, then I guess that would be the death of the channel. But we enjoy having these conversations with each other. We like conversing. We like bouncing ideas off each other. We like hearing each other's takes and opinions on the, you know, the subjects that we choose. And we love sharing them with the listening audience. And that is the last Streamlabs question for this week. If you'd like to support the channel, we have a Streamlabs link in the description below. Donate any dollar amount, ask a question. We will answer it at the end of the episode. Donate $100 or more, and we will dedicate the episode to you. With that, I'd like to thank MVG for joining me as always. Always a pleasure, Nate. Thanks for having me on. I'm going to go play with my portal some more after this <laughs> and let us know your thoughts in the comment section below on the playstation portal whether or not you picked one up if you are considering picking one up if you think it is just a waste of time and money and a wii u knockoff or if you actually like the idea and whether or not it may change your buying habit if you are in possession or will soon be in possession of a playstation portal but until next time continue to embrace the hate.